All right. Awesome. So welcome to uh, CS3510. Uh, um, this is lecture four on cryptography. So I actually used to do research in cryptography. It was one of my main interests, and it was what I focused on as a graduate student. And I worked in industry for a little bit uh, at a blockchain company. Um, so this is not really relevant to uh, that, but it is important that you know some of the, uh, the, the reason we study cryptography is because one of the greatest triumphs scientifically of the 20th century was the invention of cryptography. It, it enabled all, the, the, the tools developed for secure communication enabled all internet-based financial products because you need privacy for these things. So, so cryptography is like the science of secrecy. Um, so let's begin, I guess, with the model. So you have, there's many different models you can take on, but you have two players, A and B, and maybe it was like this, usually called Alice and Bob. Uh, and Alice and Bob want to communicate uh, privately. So they send messages back and forth to each other, and there's a, a, a third player, C, who's known as the adversary. And we usually draw them like the BSD logo. And they have, uh, in, in the normal setting, they have, in an internet-based setting, they have unprivileged access to read the communication between the two parties. Um, and this is what's known as the model. So we want to define a protocol, and a protocol is simply a set of algorithms that A and B may agree upon. We want to define a protocol that A and B may agree upon so that they can communi communicate secretly with some guarantees of privacy such that player C cannot read their messages. Now this is really important for the internet, but also technically does apply to uh, you know, e physical mail even. Um, there's so many scenarios where a, a secret channel is, is very important. Like uh, if you suppose your player A and player B is Amazon, you want to send your credit card information through the website. How do you type something into an uh, internet box and not uh, and be confident that it's not just sent or in plain text over the internet and, and your Wi-Fi router, your ISP, your neighbors, everyone knows your credit card info from that, right? So the, the cryptography has essentially enabled all these, uh, so much of the internet. Um, and as we'll see later, it's actually conditional. Uh, it's, we don't, we can't even, we can't unconditionally prove that the, the primitives used for this are secure, uh, but we can conditionally prove they're secure, assuming some strong complexity uh, theoretic assumptions, which we'll, we'll talk about later. So uh, there's, here's uh, one scheme, it's called one-time pad. Uh, one-time pad is basically like, uh, let's just suppose that we only want to consider messages not A and B interactively, but just one message from A to B first, right? So let's say A sends a message, A, a wants to send M to B, right? Something like this. So we say um, A and B have shared uh, randomness uh, R uh, with the R the same length as the message. Right, so A computes uh, M XOR R uh, and then sends to B. Uh, B computes, uh, after receiving the message, she also has uh, R, so she XORs the message with R again, and if you XOR a string with itself, it cancels out. So this is simply uh, M XOR uh, R, X, or R, right? Which is just simply M. So given this, uh, Alice and Bob are able to share messages, but what does C see? C only sees M, X, or R. And given M, X, or R, they can't determine anything about it, right? Given M, X, or R, if R is generated randomly, it, sh it can convey no information about M. Do we agree? Ah, that's called an XOR. The XOR of two bits, uh, let's say like uh, if you have uh, A and B and you want A XOR B. Uh, 
zero 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 one one zero one one. It's simply going to be one one zero zero, right? It's the XOR of the two bits, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about the security of it. This has uh, what's called perfect secrecy. But there are a lot of problems with it. This unconditionally is perfectly secure. Given R perfectly random, and what that means is complicated, it would take maybe a lecture, but given R perfectly random, M, X, or R looks indistinguishable, uh, and that's a technical term, indistinguishable from a random string. So C learns zero information about M except maybe the length of it, which in this setting we don't really care about, right? Um, but there are a lot of problems. First off, we assume that A and B have the ability to share a secret before the protocol begins. That is this shared randomness R. Uh, another problem is it is called one time pad, right? So this randomness R cannot be reused ever. For if it was, um, suppose the randomness was used twice. Suppose uh, Charlie records MX or R, but then Alice and Bob get lazy and they uh, use the same randomness again and they do M1, X or R, right? Given these two messages, uh, Charlie can compute uh, M, just XORing them together, M X or R, X or M prime uh, X or R, right? And this is going to be simply uh, M X or M prime, M1, right? And you may think, okay, well, given that the given M X or R, M1 F X or R, and M X or M1, you still can't combine those in a way to learn just M or just M1. But it turns out we assume that R may be from a high entropy distribution, but uh, so R is something that's close to perfectly random looking. M may be from a low entropy distribution. It may be natural text. It may be a vote. It may be something simple and, and, and not high entropy. So given that, we know that M X or M1 is also kind of low entropy. And it's not obvious to see why that means they learn anything, but there's a nice picture. Let's see. You can see here. So if we reuse the same key when we form, perform the XOR, we have two encrypted messages. But if we XOR them again, we can see that the information provided has low entropy. We can't extract, we, from looking at this, we can sort of apply some inference to extract the two previous images, right? So given M, X, or M1, we can extract information, even though it's not obvious how, right? So one time pad has like several problems with it. And among other ones, that's just one of the problems. Another one is like, if you change one bit of the input, uh, it changes one, it, it, it's malleable. If you change one bit of the ciphertext, you can change one bit of the answer, right? All kinds of things like this, right? So like if, if you were encrypting a bid or something, you could know to just, uh, an adversary could flip the last bit or something and increase a, uh, send a higher bid, even though they're not participating in the, in the protocol. Things like this, there's all kinds of problems like this. So one time pad, uh, if you assume the adversary fits in the box of your model, uh, then it's great. But if they don't do that, then there's lots of security problems with it. So we've looked to other uh, things. Any questions on one time pad? Yes? Yeah, and how do you do that is already a non-trivial problem. In World War One, I'm pretty sure they used to just ship giant books around full of all the randomness, you know. And then if you act, if that got leaked, then all future randomness was also leaked, so all future messages could be decrypted from that. So it's, you can't just send the randomness over the internet because then Charlie could read it, right? So it's a, maybe a chicken and egg problem with that. Um, one time pad is not really used in practice, right? Uh, there's too many problems with it even if it does have this quote unquote perfect secrecy. If it, this is defined when the adversary fits in a nice little box. Any more questions on one time pad? Yes. That was trying to show that even the, the adversary, Charlie, given two cipher texts, can extract some information that they shouldn't be able to. M X or M1 looks non-random to them, and they can extract information from that. 
right? Even if they can't extract perfect information about M or M1, they can learn something about the individual pieces, which is not what we want, right? Yeah. Oh, and that picture's also in the notes uh, from last semester. I think the new ones have not been uploaded yet. Um, right, so yes. Ah, so the, the answer, the demonstration here is this is not the best idea. So we'll come up with solutions to this where we don't have to share the Rs. Practically, you may have to, right? Um, so we say a symmetric encryption scheme is defined as uh, a tuple of algorithms, G, E, and D, such that uh, G outputs uh, a key K, so this is key generation. Um, e, uh, on input K and M, outputs a ciphertext C. So this is encryption. And then um, the decryption algorithm takes as input the same key, but then it takes on input not a message M, but a ciphertext, and it decrypts. Right? It's called a symmetric key crypto system because the same key is used for encryption and decryption, right? And we hope um, in a symmetric key crypto system that the size of the key is much, much smaller than the size of M, right? There are some symmetric key crypto systems with this property. They don't have the quote unquote perfect secrecy, but they are still uh, reasonably secure. Uh, one, a famous one is known as AES. Uh, it's very fast, it's implemented in hardware even, so you can all call your little Intel instructions and it'll do the AES stuff in a secure enclave and all that. Um, and the key, AES takes on like 128-bit keys, but can, in, uh, through uh, combinatory modes, can encrypt very large amounts of data, right? So uh, this solves, AES solves many of the problems that one time pad has, except one of the main ones, which is how do you still agree upon the shared secret key? How do you get Alice and Bob to begin with the key in the first place. So people historically were designing all these ways and assuming that the keys were secret and that the key was always known to both, both, both parties somehow. And the problem of how do you distribute the keys was considered separately, even though it's so important uh, to what it is. So along comes the definition of a uh, asymmetric crypto system. We have a public key crypto system. It's also a tuple of algorithms, G, E, and D, but they work slightly differently. So uh, G outputs pairs of keys, public key and secret key. And we want um, PK to be public, known to all parties, including the adversary. And we want the secret keys to never leave the computer. They're always not broadcasted. They are secret. But the public keys are broadcasted. Uh, we have an encryption algorithm. And the encryption algorithm takes as input the public key and the message and outputs the ciphertext C. And the decryption algorithm outputs the message M. Uh, but decryption requires the secret key M. Right. This is called an asymmetric crypto system or a public key crypto system because one of the keys is public. It could be called an asymmetric crypto system because two different keys are used for encrypting and decrypting. So the public key is used for encryption, but then the secret key is used for decryption. This is called an asymmetric crypto system. Um, now, we need to describe a protocol, which is called RSA, which solves this problem. Um, one of the reasons this works is if you have Alice and Bob, um, they both have, let's say, PK and S, we'll say PKA, and then SKA, and then they have PKB, SKB. Um, sometimes they upload their public keys to a shared key server, or sometimes they just share their public keys with each other. So let's say Alice sends the public key A to, to Bob, Bob then encrypts uh, uh, ciphertext C with the public key. 
And then Bob, given the C, decrypts it with the secret key. Right? So what Charlie sees is Charlie knows the public keys of both. Oops. The encrypted message. And that's it. And given those, given the definition of a uh, asymmetric crypto system, they are unable to learn the uh, public key. Excuse me, they are unable to learn the message because they don't have the secret key. You can think of a public key crypto system kind of like, a, like the public key is a box that you can lock, but then you need the secret key to open it. So think of like an envelope that anyone can close, but only someone with the secret key can open it. So you can put stuff into a mailbox, but only someone can take it out of the mailbox. That's kind of the way to think about a public key crypto system. Any questions on just the definition of a public key crypto system before we get into how to implement it? Yeah. No, so PK is public key. Yeah. Private key, I think that's fine. But PK and SK is the notation I was raised on, so. Yeah, pub I've heard it. I've heard it to refer to as public key and private key, though. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they both run the gen algorithm and generate their own pair. They can't exchange them in practice. There's like key servers. You upload your public key to GitHub.com and then you keep your secret key, right? So, is there another question? Yeah. No, when sending a message to A, you encrypt it with their public key, and you don't touch your secret key. Yes, because those are the messages for A. If you want to send a message to A, you use their public key. If you want to decrypt a message that A has received, you use their private key, their secret key. Yes. More questions? Okay, yeah. Ah, so that's, that's one of the great things. They don't. So the public key A can be transmitted publicly, and it doesn't reveal anything to adver the adversary. Uh, B generates the message. So suppose B wants to send this message to A, right? This also doesn't have uh, some of the problems that uh, RSA, excuse me, the one-time pad does with key reuse, right? You can reuse the public keys over and over, up to an extent. There are some other problems that are not defined here. For example, uh, let's say you were a voting system and you knew that the only two messages that could be sent were a yes and a no. You know that the, if the entry pre is so small of the message space, you just simply need to vote once, record your own messages, and then count the ciphertexts. Then you can know the vote tally without knowing who voted, but you can know who won, something like this, right? There's also, you know, you can pretend you're someone else. You could take the ciphertext and then just keep it and then copy it and send it again. There's integrity issues, right? So in the vanilla setting, there's still some problems that we have. Uh, but this is not a cryptography class. But those problems are solved in more complicated ways. Yeah. The what? So, like, imagine you have, like, a, a letterbox, right? And anyone can put anything into the letterbox, but only the secret key holder can open the letterbox. Putting something into the letterbox is the public key analogy. Or you can imagine anyone can put anything in, into an envelope and close the envelope. But all, and all the envelopes are public knowledge. The adversary sees all the public en envelopes, but is unable to open any of the envelopes because they don't have the private key. So all the closed boxes are visible, but none of the boxes can be opened unless you have the secret key. Yes. Ah, no, so the, the keys are paired. So the secret key of B only decrypts messages encrypted with the public key B. Yes, certainly.
which which key? Public key A. Uh, yeah. Ah, so they run their own encryption out. They run their own SSH key gen, and then it generates a public and private key pair. How do they know how to wet? How do they know how to wet? Oh, they somehow, that's sort of part, I think that's assumed. Like in some case, let's say you're doing, you're using SSH key gen for GitHub. You know you're you and GitHub knows it's GitHub, and you know you want to communicate with GitHub, right? So you know it says upload your public key, and then you click upload. That's what basically what happens. Yeah. We'll have to describe the protocol that solves this problem. This is just a definition of an asymmetric encryption system. We haven't even talked about the algorithms that implement uh, G, E, and D. Yes? B does not have the private key of A. No, it only has the public key of A. The secret keys are never left on the internet. The public keys are propagated, you know. You can go look up the key servers right now and see famous people's private keys. Linus Torvaldis has like six private keys on all the key servers. But um, the secret key has never left his computer, hopefully. Right? All right. Um, in order to talk about uh, how to actually implement this, this is an ideal definition. This isn't actually an algorithm. This is just like what we hope the algorithm achieves. We would hope it has these desirable properties because then we have solved the uh, pre-secret shared key problem. Um, we need to describe uh, how to implement this. And it is implemented from tools from number theory. Now, number theory uh, is an ancient mathematical art dating back thousands and thousands of years. And it took thousands and thousands of years for someone to find an application of it. So uh, number theorists will not stop talking about RSA because of it's the first time their, their famously parlor math has been useful in some setting. And it's been extremely useful. So we need to talk about some algorithms uh, on numbers uh, that uh, use uh, number theory. I guess before we should do that, we should talk about the model, right? So like, why is this secure? So like, in the, what do we mean b by secure? So the definition we use for security is uh, inherited from semantic security. And without getting too deep into it, we can define a protocol to be secure um, is secure if the best strategy an adversary has is guessing the key. Right, so an adversary can always guess the key. You want the key to be long enough of uh, several bits long so this doesn't occur. Usually, st I think RSA standard is now like 4,096 bits. Um, previous records that have been broken are like 800 bits and so on. But you want uh, the best protocol, you want the best strategy an adversary could have is to guess the key. And that's an intuitive definition. If the best strategy that you can do is guess the key, and guessing the key takes exponential time, then we know that the adversary should not be able to break the pr protocol. That's a pure intuition-based thing. The way you may show that mathematically is, what is the probability that you correctly guess the key? Let's see, C guesses, say Charlie guesses uh, n bit key. What is the probability you correctly guess an n bit key? Yeah, it depends on the entropy of the key, but if we assume some uniform randomness of the key space, which is not necessarily true, but the probability that you can guess the key is uh, uh, 2 to the minus n, right? Negligible probability, right? But, so the way we define uh, security, the, the protocol is secure is the probability that uh, Charlie learns anything about the message m even a single bit about the message M, even the probability of a bit being 90 to 10 about message M, anything about message M must be less than 2 to the minus N. 
where n is the length of the key. That's what we define the protocol to be secure. And you can demonstrate that through some conditionally uh, if you were to do a, uh, a cryptographic proof. But this is the definition, this is the model of, uh, of security, right? Um, given PKA, PKB, and the encryption of PKA, we claim that those three pieces of information provide, there, there is no polynomial time algorithm that, given those three pieces of information, can extract anything about M. Yes? Yes. And unlike the one-time pad model, we assume that Charlie is what's called a probabilistic polynomial time adversary, which means they have access to randomness and they have only polynomial time algorithms at their disposal, at their disposal, right? So like, you can brute force every key and fine. But I think the current record is like, if you were to try and brute force a key for RSA to decrypt it, it would take 500 years, something like this, right? So we're really hedging against considering the growth rate of computers and everything, it would take so much electricity as the amount of joules the sun outputs or something, right? So in that sense, it is technically possible to uh, decrypt uh, this encrypted ciphertext here by just simply guessing SK, but they can't do it in a feasible amount of time. That's what, our, what's we're, what we're hedging against, yes. Absolutely, all the old private keys uh, are compromised, but then it's fine because you just generate a new pair. That's the other thing of key servers is like they tell you this key is old, don't use it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and that is a problem actually. And there's like, that's why there's a rush for NIST to implement post-quantum algorithms because we think that someone is storing all the messages all, excuse me, all the ciphertexts and may be able to decrypt. If a quantum computer comes online in like 10 years, all these quantum non-resistant algorithms are vulnerable. So even though there's like debate, are these protocols secure or not? We do know that um, uh, if, if a quantum computer comes online in 10 years, then all these messages are for free, basically. So. Even though we debate the security algorithms, SSH has already implemented them and has made them default or over RSA, which is an interesting uh, thing at least. Controversial, maybe. All right, so now let's talk about number theory. Uh, one of the oldest algorithms um, is called GCD and you probably have heard of it. Uh, the GCD of two numbers is the greatest common divisor of those two numbers, right? So you're given two numbers, you're given the greatest common divisor of them. So for, for example, uh, what is the GCD of like 15 and 3? Yeah. You can think of GCD almost like a set intersection if you want to. The f A is made up of some numbers, B is made up of some numbers, the GCD is the greatest number which divides both A and B evenly, right? So 3 goes into 15 and 3 goes into 3. So the GCD of 15 and 3 is 3. What about like, I don't know, GCD of, uh, I don't know, 24 and uh, uh, 21, right? You can do that one. It's also three, yeah. Because that's, so what is 24? That's two times 12, which is three. 12 is two times six. Am I doing that right? That's gonna be, that's gonna be two squared. And then six is gonna be two times, no, I'm not sure I'm doing that right. What, is, what are the factors of 24? Two to the three, three, is that right? All right, and then 21 is three times seven. So three and three are shared, so you put a three there, right? GCD. Now, Euclid uh, came up with this algorithm before we even had good definitions of algorithms. Um, and it's a really beautiful and early example of an algorithm because it's so simple. Um, if uh, B is equal to zero, return A. Else, return uh, the GCD of A and B, minus, B mod A. 
make sure I got that right. I may have swapped the order. So it is a recursive algorithm. Um, and it simply notes that uh, the GCD of A and B is equal to the GCD of A mod B and B. Right? And it's such a simple, elegant, uh, recursive algorithm. It's, it, 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 but we need to prove correctness of it, because it's not obvious why that works. So to prove correctness of something like this, what we need to show is using a little bit of number theory that um, the GCD of A and B is equal to the GCD of A uh, minus B and B, right? Do we agree that's right? Also notice that the GCD arguments are symmetric. It doesn't really matter what order you put them in. GCD of A and B is equal to GCD of B, of B and A, right? So, and we, proving this is sufficient for proving that simply because the um, repeated application of this will just, if you minus b, minus b, minus b, minus b, you'll eventually just hit a mod b. We agree? So we can conclude that if we demonstrate this fact, then the algorithm is correct, right? So let's just do it. Um, so we'll, let's say, uh, uh, let, uh, D be equal to the GCD of A and B. So we know that uh, D, is a, D is a number probably smaller than A and B, but is a factor of both A and B. So we can write D divides A and uh, D divides B. Do we agree? You guys are familiar with this notation? D goes into A, D goes into B somehow. It's the definition of GCD, right? So, um, uh, a is equal to some, let's say, dk. Uh, B is equal to some dl, right? And k and l are some other numbers that make up the factor. But d is a factor of A, and d is a factor of B. We know that to be true, right? So what do we know about, uh, so we know that A minus B is an equal to dk minus dl, which is equal to d times k minus l, right? Um, but we know that D is then a factor of A minus B. So D divides A minus B, right? So we know then that D divides the GCD of A minus B and B. So we've shown that the GCD of AB divides the GCD of A minus B and B. Now, the way we're going to prove these two to be equivalent is show that one number divides into the other and the other number divides into it. And by doing so, if two numbers divide each other, they must be equal, right? Makes sense. So D, again, is GCD of AB. We've shown that it divides the GCD of A minus B and B. Questions on this half? The reverse is basically the same. It's not too important that you know how to do this. D prime, let's say D, D prime is equal to GCD of A minus B and B. So we know that... Uh, D prime divides B, and D prime divides A minus B, right? So we know that uh, B is equal to some, let's say, D prime L, and we know that uh, A minus B is equal to some D prime K, right? But then we know that A minus B plus B is equal to uh, dl, uh, d prime l plus dk, d prime k, which is equal to d prime l plus k, right? Is that right? Um, so we know then that uh, d prime divides, uh, we know that, excuse me, what is a plus b minus b is simply a. So we know that a, d prime, is a factor of A. So we already know that D prime was a factor of A minus B. So we know that uh, D prime, excuse me, D prime is a factor of A. Uh, D prime is also a factor of B. So we know that D prime is a factor of both A and B. So D prime is a factor of the GCD and A of, of A and B. Make sense? Fairly simple stuff. 
Yes? D prime is the uh, GCD of A minus B and B. So we're assuming D, we're trying to show that uh, D divides this side and then D prime divides that side. This, right? If two numbers divi divide each other, then we can conclude that this is true. All right? Questions on this demonstration? Yeah. Well, implicitly, by show, it, that's a great point. Because we sh it's like a double set containment, kind of. We showed both ways go. So it can only be the case that they're equal. So in that sense, it is the greatest one. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the runtime of this. Um, it's not obvious what the runtime of, of this is, and we don't even need to apply the master theorem, but we can kind of talk about the recursion of this. Uh, we know that, or maybe we don't know, but I can tell you that A mod B is uh, less than or equal to uh, A over two, right? So every two recursive calls, you can say, uses one bit of the uh, answer. So there's approximately a linear amount of recursive calls. More like two n recursive calls, right? Every time you mod a, you go down a factor. Uh, and that it takes maybe two recursive calls to use a bit of the answer. Um, what, what is the work being done at each level? Uh, what, in terms of the bits of a and b, let's suppose they're both n bit numbers, what is the approximate uh, um, time it takes to compute a mod b? This, again, we didn't talk about, but perhaps you can believe that you only need to scan the bits one time, and so that takes linear time. So it's a linear amount of work done at each level. So this is approximately O of n squared time. That's a, a, a little finicky on that one. But what we can say for certain is that computing GCD is efficient. That's really the takeaway of the algorithm, rather than the specific complexity. Uh, computing the GCD is a very efficient uh, algorithm, right? That's what I want you to take away. Uh, another thing about the GCD algorithm is it allows you to compute what's called modular inverses. There is something called the extended Euclidean algorithm, uh, which we won't get too deep into, but it basically allows you to compute, uh, so a modular inverse, if A, uh, consider A mod N, the only valid numbers mod N are gonna be one to A minus one, right? Those are all the numbers, if we exclude zero, mod N, right? So a modular inverse, or we can even count zero, right? A modular inverse is a number, A inverse, such that A, A inverse is congruent to one mod N, right? Uh, so it's not the reciprocal of A, but it's another number mod A in the equivalence classes uh, such that a times that number is equivalent to one. In some sense, it acts like a reciprocal, but isn't. We can use this. We can use the recursion calls of the Euclidean algorithm. It turns out to compute this. I won't describe how. It'll take the rest of the lecture. But it is possible for us to do this. Here's an example. What is the inverse of three uh, mod five? Let's see if you can work that one out. Seven? What is seven mod five? Yes, two, yes. Seven would work though, just seven is two in mod five. Think of, think of uh, without getting too much into like group theory, think of that the only numbers that exist are zero through four, 
There's no other numbers. Those are the numbers that we care about. All the other numbers, the infinitely many of them have been casted into only four groups, whether they're 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. I guess that's five groups, mod 5, right? So we know that the inverse of 3 is 2. Why is that the case? Because 3 times 2 is equal to 6, which is uh, congruent to 1 mod 5, right? So one more quick practice on what's the inverse of 2? Why? Same reason, the 2 times 3 is congruent to 6 mod 5. So the inverses of a number in the group share the similar properties as like the reciprocals that you understand, right? The reciprocal of 1, the reciprocal of the reciprocal is the other, right? So like we know that, for example, the 2 inverse, inverse is equivalent to 2, right? Stuff like that. So it shares a lot of those properties. Now, we'll, we'll need this, uh, the fact of computing modular inverses uh, later. Three was just an example. Ah, I asked what was the inverse of two. Ah, so uh, I five is a small one because you can just check all the values. So two times zero, two times one, two times two, two times three mod five is one. In fact, we know that A inverse exists mod uh, N uh, if and only if of the GCD of uh, A and N is congruent to 1. So A and N are relatively prime. If N is a prime number, then all the inverses exist for all of its numbers, right? Not every number has an inverse. 5 is prime, which is why every number has an inverse. But there are some, try 6 or try 4. There will be some numbers less than 4 that don't have an inverse, right? All right. Um, Let's go to the main topic of today. Uh, we need something called what's called Fermat's Little Theorem, not Fermat's Last Theorem. Fermat was a pretty famous guy. He was this judge. Being a mathematician wasn't a recognized job, so it was all done recreationally. And he used to do all this kind of stuff in his part time when, you know, before the internet, he had nothing else to do. So Fermat's little theorem in plain language sta states that um, if uh, P is prime and A is less than or equal to P minus 1, then A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. Kind of a big deal. He's able to prove a power of a recurrence um, with nothing else except uh, uh, without having to compute it. So if you ever know that A is less than P minus 1 and it's raised to the power of P minus 1, you can simply just say it's 1 by Fermat's little theorem. You can uh, apply Fermat's little theorem and uh, simplify any uh, modular arithmetic that you may be working on. Any, have you guys seen this before? Fermat's little theorem in any class? Any cl Okay, um, so let's prove this. And the proof has been famously simplified over the years. What we're going to show is that first we need to show, like let S be the set of numbers 1 to P minus 1. And let A of S uh, be the numbers uh, A to A uh, to, uh, excuse me, A times P minus 1, right? And this is all mod P. Right. So what we want to prove here is that multiplying every number from 1 to p minus 1 by a simply permutes everything. That's what we want to show. Multiplying by a simply just rearranges everything. You can think of uh, it like kind of a random permutation. Some of these numbers may be bigger than p, but then you mod by p anyway. So we can show, we want to show that S is equivalent to AS for any A P less than or equal to P minus 1. That's what we want to demonstrate. Uh, and we can do that in two ways. We can show first that 0 is not in A to the S, 
We'll show that. And then we'll show that each element of a to the s is different. So there are no two duplicates in the set uh, here, right? Sets, of course, don't have duplicates, but suppose they did, right? We'll, we'll, we'll prove no two of them have duplicates, and there's exactly, you know, p minus two elements still, right? You should convince yourself that if we can demonstrate those two properties, if we can demonstrate those two properties about a to the s, then that's sufficient to show that it's equivalent to s. Can you believe that? So suppose, uh, we'll prove what the first property first. Suppose that 0 was in a to the s, right? So that uh, then uh, there is an i, uh, excuse me, an, uh, an i with uh, 1 less than equal to i less than equal to p minus 1, uh, such that a to the i is congruent to 0 mod p. Suppose that's true. Assume to the contrary, it's true. If it's true, uh, well, we know that p is a prime number. And so we know that the modular inverse is, is, exists relative to uh, p. So a inverse exists. So consider a inverse a i, right? This could be congruent to two things, a inverse a i, which is congruent to 0, because a i assuming is 0. So this is congruent to 0 uh, mod p, right? In, even in modular arithmetic, multiplication by zero, anything by 0 is still 0. Uh, but it's also equivalent to a inverse a i, right? Depends on how you, you can associate the, the two numbers that way. But that's congruent to just i mod p. But that means that i must have been 0. Contradiction. i is not 0. There is no i in the set s that is 0. So there is a 0 in a to the s only if there was a 0 in, a, in s. But there is no 0 in s, so there can't be a 0 in a to the s. Conclusion, are you guys believe that? You guys agree? Fairly simple stuff. Um, let's do another. Let's do the proof of property 2. Suppose that ai is congruent to aj, but uh, i does not equal j, mod p, right? Suppose that's true, that a to the s has two distinct num two same numbers, but by definition s has all distinct numbers. So suppose that is true. Um, you probably can see where we're going with this. We know that an a inverse ai must be congruent then to a inverse aj mod p. But then that means that we can associate these together. So we know that i must have been congruent to j mod p. Contradiction. So given this, we can conclude then that a multiplication of all the elements of s by a is simply a permutation of the elements of s. So we do know that a to the a s it's simply a reordering of the elements of s. So we can conclude then that s is equal to a s. Do we agree? Now, why do we care about this? Uh, we know then if that those two sets are the same, that the product of all the elements is the same, mod p. Right? This notation means you take all the elements of s and you multiply them together. You take all the elements of a to the s and you multiply them together. Right? What, is, what are these equal to? What is the product of all the elements of s together? I just hit it, actually. But Remember, s is 1 to p minus 1. What happens when you multiply all those out? What's that called? Yeah, it's a factorial. So this is p minus 1 factorial, right? What is the product of a to the s factorial? Uh, a to the s. Excuse me, a s. This one's a little tricky. Well, each a to the s is simply 
a times 1, a times 2, a times 3, and so on. So it's actually going to be, there's going to be a p minus 1 factorial term you can pull out, but also, uh, how many a's are there? p minus 1 of them, right? Convince yourself that the product of all the elements of a to the s is p minus 1 factorial, a to the p minus 1. There's p minus 1 a's in there. You group those together, multiplicatively, and then there's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, all the way to p minus 1. So there's a p minus 1 factorial there. Now, what is the GCD of p and p minus 1 factorial? Yeah. So actually, because it's 1, you can cancel this out from both sides. So we see then that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. That concludes the proof. You guys see that? Any questions on the proof? Any missteps? Instead of thinking about dividing out, you can think about that since the GCD is, of this is 1, that the inverse of p minus 1 factorial exists, and you multiply both sides by the inverse. It's more polite to think of it that way than dividing out. That's not what we can work with in modular arithmetic, but it's the same thing, yes. You divide by p minus 1, quote unquote, divide by p minus 1 factorial, and you're left with a 1 on this side and an a to the p minus 1 on that side. Now, uh, we will describe but not prove a generalization of, um, for Matt's little theorem, called uh, Euler's theorem. We define this number phi of n to be equal uh, to the number of numbers uh, less than or equal uh, to p relatively prime to p. Let me make sure. So if p is a prime, what is uh, phi of p? Pop quiz. How many numbers less than p are relatively prime to p, not counting 0? So 1 to p minus 1, how many of those numbers are relatively prime to p? All of them. So if p is prime, the Euler phi function is equal to p minus 1. Right? Now if n is the product of two primes, we won't prove it, but this is actually equal to p minus 1, q minus 1. For only two primes. Now, in the case where like n is equal to p squared, there are prime powers that are greater than 1. This isn't true. This is not a general form. But it is the only special case we care about where n is a product of two primes. This is the Euler phi function. And uh, Euler's theorem, sorry, I mispronounce it all the time because it's, I mean, it's called Euler. I don't, um, is uh, if, uh, the GCD of A and N is congruent to 1 mod N, then uh, A to the phi of N is congruent to 1 mod N. Let me make sure I got that exact. Okay, so this is uh, Euler's theorem, and Euler's theorem, and we see that actually for Matt's little theorem is actually just a special case of it, right? Plug in n as a prime number, and you just get for Matt's little theorem, right? Euler's theorem is simply a generalization of for Matt's little theorem. The proof of it is also a generalization of the proof we did, so it's much harder, and we won't do it. But perhaps you can believe it to be true. We just proved the special case of it. Um, now, given we know Euler's theorem, and we know uh, for Matt's little theorem, I mean all these other things, we're ready to define uh, the RSA protocol. 
So it's based upon uh, what are called hardness assumptions. And these are uh, conditional. So as in, we haven't proved that these are hard, but we assume that they're hard with great evidence. Um, so given uh, P and Q computing n equals PQ is easy, right? How do you, given P and Q, how do you compute P times Q? You multiply them together. That can be done in a polynomial time algorithm. We gave several, we gave four algorithms for multiplication last time. Uh, given n is equal to pq, computing p and q separately, this is hard. Now, this is important. This is like the main foundation that RSA rests on, which is crazy because we can't prove it to be true. We know that multiplication is easy, but factoring is hard. So given a number, factoring it in the worst case is we consider to be a hard problem. By a hard problem, we mean there are no polynomial time algorithms for it. The only algorithms you really have are just kind of smart ways of brute force searching, but they still do not run in polynomial time, right? Factoring on like an average sense can be thought to be easy, all you have to do is like, if you're given a random number, there's a half chance it's divisible by two. Or so you just check if it's even. If not, there's like a third chance it's divisible by three. So you just check if that's divisible by three and so on. And you're very likely to factor a number. But this is a special case of factoring where n is composed of two very large, sem this is called a pseudo prime or a semi prime. It's composed of two, the product of only two primes and the, both those primes are assumed to be quite large. So as you perform a brute force search, you don't, if n is big enough, n is maybe 4,000 bits, you're not going to be able to factor it efficiently. There's no algorithms that efficiently work for this. And I worked in cryptography for a while, and I actually got very interested in complexity theory because I was trying to understand why do we assume this to be hard? What, where does the assumption of hardness come from? And it took me over a year to figure out, like learn the answer personally, why we assume this is to be a hard problem. If factoring was easy, then all these other problems collapse to being easy or some of them collapse to being hard and things don't work out the way we want them to work out, it turns out. But the security of RSA rests on this problem being hard. Why? We're going to give the players, A and B, the problem of multiplication, but then we're gonna give the adversary the problem of factoring. So that's where the security lies in. The adversary will be, in order to learn something, they must be able to factor. But the adversaries don't have to do any factoring. So the adversaries have the easy job, we give the easy job to, the adver to us, and we give the adversary the hard job. That's how the RSA security works, right? So here's how RSA works. Um, um, let's say Alice uh, uh, generates P and Q and computes N is equal to P times Q. Right. So Alice knows the prime. It doesn't generate n. It generates p and q and then computes n from that. It generates two large primes and computes their products. Alice knows p and q. So Alice computes um, phi of uh, p, q, p times q, which is equal to simply to p minus 1 and q minus 1, right? And then... Uh, Alice also generates uh, E and D mod uh, phi of n, not n, mod phi of n, uh, such that they're modular inverses of each other. E is congruent to D inverse mod phi of n. So this is the key generation step. The key is going to be composed, the keys are going to be composed of n, E, and D. E and D are modular inverses of each other, mod phi of n, right? So we know that the PK generated by Alice will be n and E, but then the secret key will simply be D, right? E is for encryption. The public key is this number n and this number E. The secret key is this number D. And you may assume that these are very large numbers of bits, right? How do you actually encode this into a program? There's like different uh, standardizations, you know, like, 
begin public key, and then it's a bunch of random looking text, and then end public key, you know, maybe you try to open a, a public key in a text file or something like this. So this is how those keys are generated, though. They're modular inverses of each other. So we've Alice and Bob again. Alice has generated the public key to be N and E, and the secret key to be D. So Alice first sends to Bob uh, the public key, or it's in a key server or whatever, but they send N and E to Bob. Bob computes uh, M to the E um, mod N. So Bob has n and Bob has e, and computes the ciphertext m to the e mod n, right? Then Bob sends the ciphertext over to uh, Alice. Now Alice, knowing this decryption key, quote unquote, uh, Alice computes m to the e to the d mod n. And I claim this is equivalent to m. So we have two things we need to prove. One, we need to prove, roughly, that uh, m to the e to the d is equivalent to m mod n. And we also need to prove that the adversary doesn't learn any information. So what is the adversary's, list, what is the adversary's uh, view? The view of the adversary is going to be e and n, and it's going to be m to the e mod n. So gi given e, n, and m to the e mod n, is there a way that they can discover m? So just given these three numbers, raising m to a power e is kind of like randomizing m throughout the space of 0 to m minus 1. That's kind of what uh, modular exponentiation behaves like. So in some sense, m to the e appears random. Now, how would they be able to brute force d? So the only way they can learn M is, assuming the protocol is correct, is they're able to guess the decryption key. So they can try to brute force D, but in order to brute force D, they need to compute the modular inverse. But they can't compute the modular inverse unless they learn phi of N. But they can't learn phi of N unless they factor. That's where the security lies. Cannot learn D unless they factor n. So if they were able to factor n, they compute phi of n as p minus 1, q minus 1. Then they can run the uh, extended Euclidean algorithm modular inverse uh, compute, uh, algorithm, and they can extract d from that. And then using d, they do, could decrypt. But unless they can do that, they can't do it. So the only solution that c has is to factor. But we assume Conditionally, factoring is a hard problem. That's the security. That's where the security lies. That's the security argument. Any questions on the security argument before we get to the correctness argument? Yes. Exactly. The n, the n is given publicly. The p and the q are not. The P and the Q are stored separately. Then that is the secret. Actually, the, uh, you could even think that it's not even defined that A stores P and Q. Because A doesn't need P and Q. A just needs to complete the protocol, just needs D. Right? So I don't, I don't think there's a scenario where it would help to store P and Q separately. But because uh, I'm thinking about in practice, do they actually store P and Q? And I don't think so. So. Maybe they just forget about it. They're like, I don't want to keep this on my hard drive or whatever, right? So, uh, D is computed using this modular inverse algorithm. So Alice, during the key generation protocol, and this is important, we offset a lot of the security into the key generation. Before, keys were just generated randomly. Here, they have a little bit of structure. E and P, because Alice knows P and Q, they know phi of n, because that's P minus 1, Q minus 1. And if they know phi of n, they also can compute two numbers, E and D, which are mod inverses of each other. Now, you don't want to choose certain numbers this way, but it's assumed that they can generate E and D 
efficiently that are inverses of each other, right? You don't want e to be three, for example. That's not a good one, but that sometimes that happens, you know. So there's more you could say on the key generation part, but you assume that uh, they can do this part. The key gener the adversary cannot, given e, cannot generate d, right? It can't even generate other keys mod n because it doesn't know the factorization of n, right? That's the reliance of, of uh, RSA, right? More questions on the security before we get to the correctness? Yes. This is a great question, and it turns out that a lot of, um, what fascinates me is that a lot of the algorithms for uh, primality are, are um, efficient. GCD is efficient. Primality is efficient. Determining if a number is prime is efficient. But factorization of a number is not efficient. And that blows my mind, because all the other algorithms for primality are efficient except factorization. And it seems like it's almost, like there's a simple way you could use GCD to solve it, or something like this. Like if you test GCD of a number against all the primes, you can determine a factor that way, because the GCD of PQ and P is just going to be P, right? But P is big, and so is N. It's 4,000 bits. You can't brute force search all the way to P. It's not going to work. All right. all right, let's go through the uh, correctness proof real quick. We just want to prove. Uh, by correctness, what do we mean? We mean we want to prove that uh, m to the e to the d is equivalent to m uh, mod uh, n, right? So we know that e and d are modular inverses of each other mod phi of n. So we know, um, how did I write this? So we know that e times d is congruent to one mod uh, phi of n, right? Which is, uh, the same thing as mod uh, p minus 1, uh, q minus 1, right? Do we agree? Well, I'm saying 5n is just the same as p minus 1, q minus 1. So we know then, actually, that we can write e times d as some k, p, q minus 1, oh, I'll just keep this consistent, p minus 1, uh, q minus 1, uh, plus 1. We know that to be true. Right? Now, you know some rules about exponentiation, how you can, this doesn't really matter, you can swap the terms, you can group them. So we know that, actually, m to the e to the d is equivalent to m to the e times d, right? What that's equivalent to, as we can plug this in, m to the k p minus 1 uh, q minus 1 plus 1, right? But that's equivalent to m to the k phi of m m. That may take a second, but split some stuff up, move stuff around, you can get that out, right? Let's take two seconds on that one. Skip some steps there, but you guys believe that to be true? Now, what does Euler's theorem state? Did I erase it? Nope, it's right there. This is all done mod n. So m to the k mod n, m to the k raised to the power of 5 n is congruent to 1 mod n. This is all done mod n, right? So we know that this is just 1. So this whole thing is congruent to m mod n. So we see that m to the e to the d is congruent to m mod n, and that uh, the communication between Alice and Bob is correct. It's not only correct, it's secure, conditionally secure on factorization. Yes. Euler's theorem, which we didn't prove but assumed as a generalized case of, uh, for Matt's little theorem. A to the phi of n is congruent to 1 mod n. Exactly, yeah, just cancel it out. Split stuff up, move it around, and just get rid of that whole term. 
All right, I have one more comment on uh, RSA in practice. And that multiplication for 4,000-bit numbers is too slow for the browser. There's some stat like every two milliseconds uh, that you make the user wait on clicking like purchase, the sales drop by 10% or something like this. So there's really, really, they try to speed this up to the milliseconds as fast as they can. So what happens in practice is they just use RSA. RSA does solve the, key sh uh, the, the previously shared secret key problem. But they don't send all messages via RSA because it's too expensive to can repeatedly multiply 4,000, repeatedly exponentiate 4,000 bit numbers. So what they do instead is they simply use RSA to share a secret key, a session key. And then they use symmetric key encryption like AES, which is implemented all the way down to the instruction level uh, to perform the computation that way. So asymmetric key enables symmetric key encryption. All right, that's all I have for you. I will be available uh, for some questions.